welcome to Cataclysm Magazine. We can be found on the web at www.cataclysm.com. And I'd like to welcome to the show uh, once again my good friend Rick Fox. Um, Rick, um, I've interviewed you twice before, and we've been chatting it up the last couple of days in preparation for the interview tonight. And um, we're going to be talking about a couple things, but um, the main topic of conversation I want to talk about is um, the Steeler album. And um, initially, when I contacted you about doing the interview, was because you had mentioned that some of your photographs were. Um, that you taken years ago of Kiss were used in the recent documentary. So why don't we start the interview talking ab ab about those photos and how they got used in the documentary? <clears throat> okay, well, thanks for having me back on again, Jason. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, of course, greetings to all your listeners and fans. Um, the Kiss photos it goes back to when I was in, still in high school. So we're talking like 1972. Wow, yeah. And uh, I was uh, also, I, I got on all these different committees. I was on the dance committee, so I had access to working with the bands that would come in. You know, I kind of got my, my first roadie experience, if you will, just oh. helping them, you know, uh, offload and onload and things like the stage setup and all that. And then I also was in a, a the photo club. So I had access to the photo lab in school, the photography club, all the chemicals and materials I could get my hands on were free. How cool is that? Wow. Very, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, cause, you know, it costs money. Yeah, yeah. So, um, um, my, my dad had got me uh, a really expensive German camera. and uh, the, But the pictures that I took at Coventry of Kiss, <clears throat> I was using a box camera, and I didn't know... I didn't have enough to prep time to completely know how to work it properly. Wow. So that, that's why the quality in some of the pictures, is, it varies from picture to picture. And I didn't have some of the F-stops, or if people remember what those are, yeah, yeah. Uh, open properly long enough because there were pictures of, of them moving across the stage, like Gene doing his, his Godzilla stomp thing, and, and his picture would blur across the screen. kind of made it... Uh, I know Gene's a big fan of the of the film. Um, oh, what the hell? It's on the tip of my tongue now. Uh, Carnival of Souls. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and some of these pictures, he looks like that, that character with the white face and the black eyes yeah. that was antagonizing the, the girl that was between the, the worlds of the living and the worlds of the dead. Oh. So he kind of has that white smeared, black and white face in some of the pictures. But some of the other pictures came out okay. Oh, wow. And, and uh, yeah, they had... They had Kiss had just gotten a little bit of money, uh, you know, from from a coin management who just started working with them, and they got all new marshals. They got the the, the fire engine lights, the red fire engine wow. lights. They got some new costuming, some boots, uh, and things like that. And uh, Paul was still kind of uh, um, experimenting back and forth between the star makeup and the bandit, the raccoon makeup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, you know. And Coventry was a club that was in Queens. Um, if you were driving, it was about maybe 15 minutes from my house, 15, 20 minutes wow. from my house. I have walked it sometimes in really cold weather and it took me like a couple hours, but, um, and it was on Queens Boulevard, I believe. And, uh, let's see, I used to be the popcorn club or a popcorn pub. Um, I don't remember what it was before that, but it was Coventry and a lot of the bands from Manhattan were playing there you know the, the rock and roll yeah yeah glamish, yeah you know the glamish bands and um kiss didn't play very many of the clubs in new york they they did the ones in queens and long island like the daisy okay so i was down there with my with this box camera and i was you know in the front row and and they came on and i was just jamming away taking pictures taking pictures taking pictures and and i had hoped for the best that they would come out you know, like that. And and a box camera takes a negative that's about, mm, I want to say maybe three inches by three inches, something like that. It's a bigger negative. Yeah. Like that, you know. And and so I worked with that. And I got those pictures. Uh, my my um, Fillmore East pictures came out much better. But that's when I was using the German uh, 35 millimeter camera. And I was, I had the, you know, I was better at it at that point. So the, the pictures came out much better. But, uh, you know, it was always kind of a little bit of an experiment. Well, you know, the, the, the fact that you're, you're one of the first people to photo kiss, I mean, like you said, these photos date back to 1972. And like you said, um, some of the pictures or um, that early makeup, like, that kind of looked like what was on the, the very first Kiss album. 
And for that reason alone, I think people would love to see the photos, you know? Yeah, well, you know, Kiss was experimenting with what they were trying to look like and where they were going to go with yeah, yeah. their look. And, you know, they, they tried the New York Dolls look, but everybody was already doing that. So they that's when they had to branch off, and I guess they had their, their brainstorming session and figured out that each one is going to play a different personal character or persona. Oh, yeah. And they went more with the black and white and silver, you know, with the, and the leather and the studs and all of that and to look you know, more heavier. Now, let me ask you, um, Rick, you, in one of the previous interviews you'd done with me, you, you had stated that um, that you had dated Peter Chris's um, sister or something like that briefly. So um, did you get to take pictures of Kiss uh, have anything to do with, um, you know, knowing Peter Chris at all? Or um, was that just kind of something that happened on the side? No, that was, uh, well, I met him first. Okay, okay. I, I, had to, I had met him first way before he was in Kiss. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, he, he was in a band called Chelsea, and they put out one album. And, and they were kind of like a, a Grateful Dead-ish type band. Or uh, after, I want to I use the example of when Blue Cheers stopped being the heaviest, loudest band in the world at that point, they kind of went in you know, the San Francisco scene, they kind of went a little more psychedelic and almost Grateful Dead-ish sounding. So Chelsea was kind of like that. And, and they had just broken up and Peter was you know, looking for a gig. So he would come over his, his uh, parents' apartment all the time. Uh, you know, they had just moved from Williamsburg, Brooklyn, to Greenpoint, which is where I lived. Okay. And, it, and the family just happened to live around the corner from me. Interesting. interesting. Yeah, interesting. And now um, people should understand these photos we're talking about that eventually ended up in the Kiss documentary that was on A&E, um, you know, in June. Um, that, that many of these photos have ended up like on uh, Kiss bootlegs. And, and there's been a thing about you not really receiving the proper... Um, credit on many of these things that the photos ended up in. And I know that it also ended up, uh, some of your photos ended up on the cover of a Kiss book, Nothing to Lose, which I happen to have and looking at right now. But um, So talk a little bit about that. I mean, um, what what was it like to, you know, that's the very first thing, Nothing to Lose, when first time you got like your photo on an official kind of piece of Kiss merchandise. What was that like? Well, I have to correct you right there. Uh, the picture on, on the cover of uh, Ken Sharp's book, Nothing, so that's not mine. Okay. My, my, my pictures are inside. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, huh? yeah. I don't, I don't know who. T I was down front. That, that's a picture from like further back in a, in the hall. Uh, oh, okay. Of, of, of a show. I don't even know if that's the same show, but uh, because this, you can't see the the, the spider web. Oh, okay. The that, that's a different show, but uh, you know, and of course, my my gratitude to Ken Sharp for being the first to recognize, uh, you know, my being constantly omitted over the decades yeah, by yeah. very Kiss authors. So he was the first to kind of put me on the map as far as my pictures getting rec official recognition. And um, so uh, and he contacted me and, and interviewed me and asked me about my memories and, and things like that, high points and whatnot, and, and put some of my, my pictures in his book. And then, uh, so what, where, what was that? Um, That's pretty much it. You know, he, yeah. he put me in, in his book. Yeah, yeah. And then, um, and so... It, Kind of bring people up to date, like um, with the Kiss documentary. How did the photos end up on that? Was somebody from the um, Kiss team, um, you know, was it somebody in the band or the management that contacted you? Well, what happened was when I first got wind of this a couple of years ago, uh, when they first started to discuss this uh, and it hit the internet, uh, I contacted Doc McGee's office several times. Okay. You know, I, I know Doc, I, I know he knows me. Uh huh. And, and, um, you know, and it's like I said, I've met him. We, we we talk briefly, so it's not like I'm a complete stranger. I contacted his office several times. I uh, spoke to some young-sounding guy. No one ever called me back. Wow. I said, I've got this, I've got that, I've got pictures, I've got blah 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 blah. Never heard a word back from anyone. And then uh, I don't know. If, uh, I forget exactly when I got contacted for this A and E project. Uh, it was Kiss author uh, Kurt Gooch. Oh wow! So Kurt reached out and said, hey, listen, I'm involved with this project. We'd like to license some of your photos. And I said, okay. And we worked out an arrangement. And, and uh, you know, I licensed them, uh, several of the photos. And uh, I haven't seen the documentary yet, but uh, he, he, he told me that, uh, you know, like when they mentioned a certain thing about whatever they're talking, then they'd zoom in on the picture from, from Coventry, from, from that era. So uh, my gratitude, I guess, you know, to, to, to Kurt, and, and, and Ken Sharp both uh, for give, you know, giving me that recognition. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Is, is You mentioned about my pictures being used without credit. That's absolutely true. 
uh, right long after I arrived in California, I was getting a little tight for money. Um, the day job that I had set up fell through. Wow. So I was kind of, you know, biting hard a little bit. And I sold some pieces, bits and pieces of my Kiss scrapbook. And some of those were actual printed photos that were mounted on cardboard that were in the, in the uh, you know, thin sheets of cardboard that yeah. were glued into, into the pages in this book. So I sold them to this guy who was a huge Kiss fan. And he wound up eventually working for me as like a roadie. Wow. Uh, and, and little did I know that, you know, the, the, the you know, what do they call it? The familiarity breeds contempt. Uh, that that he, he was jealous and, and hated this and hated that. And the guy was, he turns out to be, the guy's like a perv, you know. He's, he's, he likes, likes little girls. He's, he's like, wow. wow. You know, yeah, he goes after minors, that kind of thing, you know. Wow. So I distanced myself from him. But he, he was the one, I believe, that, first started making copies of my photos and reselling them and from there it went on and on and it just tumbled around the world because my name wasn't on any of the photos yeah yeah wow and people started putting their own names and their own watermarks on my photos wow you know and and i went after a few of them on the internet like some of them were over like in germany and and, and over in europe and i said those are my photos i still have the negatives and you either put my name on them or take them down. Wow. And, and most, most of the ones I contacted complied. Uh, but, and then a, f a couple of years ago, somebody contacted me, a friend of mine in, in LA contacted me, and he, he, I got a link that says, he goes, just go to Google. I said, where'd you get that picture? He goes, go to Google and type in KISS 1972. And I'm telling you, a huge page is opened of, of people s selling pirated bootlegs of KISS you know, music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and tons of them were using my photos. Wow. So now... I, I don't have Gene's financial resources... Yeah, yeah, yeah. ...to go after all these people, and what am I going to get from them? No, but that's what makes nice um, the fact that the, the, the ones that ended up in the documentary, at least these are licensed to you now, and, um, and you know, um, so, so I assume that means when they're licensed to you that anybody that uses those photos... Um, they, they got to give you the credit and give you a little something for the use of them, right? Well, that would be, on paper, that would be the right thing to do, the, yeah, the yeah. ethical thing. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I got contacted also a few years ago by a Swedish KISS fan magazine called Destroyer, and, and they asked me permission to use my photos. Wow. Uh, and they used pictures of mine and pictures that Lydia, of course, took, and they gave me photo credit, and I said, on the condition that you put in your magazine yeah. that these, all these pictures have been stolen and you've been used illegally by various KISS people around the world. Wow. And they, act, they actually did. They put it in the magazine. So they, they kind of started putting the word out there. And then I got contacted by a guy named Roger Bernard, who, who has put together something called the, the, the Black Books, which are all his... his uh, he's a huge fan. He's got all these KISS stuff in his collection. Uh-huh. And he had copies of the same pictures. And he said, are these your pictures? And he showed me a whole bunch. I said, yeah, all the ones you're showing me, those are all mine. Wow. He goes, I never knew that. I, I'd see them being published around the world and never knew where they came from. And he then started to put my name on all of the stuff in his books. And wow. he also helped put the word out that all of these pictures have been pirated and stolen from me and used illegally. Well, well what a cool guy he is, you know, to, to help. help. Yeah. Um, and, and let me ask you, because uh, it, um, it was a really great documentary. I mean, it, it, um, they spent two nights on it because a simple fact is like 50 years of Kiss, you know, and it's hard to get that in one night. But I tell you, it was very nicely done, I thought, Rick, as a, as a Kiss fan myself. Hopefully you get to see it one day, but um, or maybe they'll release it on DVD or something. But um, as somebody that's kind of been in the Kiss camp, you know, back from back in 1972, um, I'm sure you've heard someone talk about the fact that... Um, Ace and Peter didn't. They chose not to take part. They were demanding like to be paid all this money and, and get to decide what gets in and what didn't make it into the documentary and just be paid ridiculous amounts of money. What do you think about um, you know their their decision to have such kind of um, wild demands? Well, I can't really speak for Peter and Ace. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's personal business. Yeah, yeah. Between them, um, you know, I was going to say what really is is interesting to me is just seeing all of the various fans and all the various uh, different KISS Facebook pages Get upset, going yeah. gaga ga ga on WOW and this, that, and the other on back then on the original KISS. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, th and I'm thinking, you know, and I was there. Yeah, I was there. Yeah, yeah. I, watched, I, watched, I watched that form. I watched that. I watched before it was actually called KISS, you yeah, know, back yeah. rehearsing, rehearsing in their loft. 
before Ace was in the band. Wow. And, and, you know, it's, and, and they, some of them say, well, you know, uh, how great was that for you? And, you know, why I wish I could have been there. Yeah, yeah. And, lie on the wall and so it kind of tickles me a little bit to know that i was part of that history and here's people like you know 40 50 some odd years later going man i wish i was there man and then that gets so they're so uh emotionally involved passionate about about that early kiss you know like that and then uh you know and then you've got well you know it kind of always was the gene and, P- and paul show and, and paul show yeah yeah you sure. know i mean they were the core they put out the ads, you know, looking for this, and Peter put his ad looking, I'm looking for that, yeah. like that. So they kind of had a, an idea and a vision about where they wanted to go with it. So they were always kind of the business guys running everything. Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. And, you know? and being that you were a guy that was, you know, back um, around Kiss back in 72, were you around, like, ever to see Bob Kulik, um in those days on the New York scene? I didn't see Bob that Okay. No, I didn't know him then. Okay. Uh, I, I was, I, I, well, various friends, you know, we were constantly going to this place and that yeah. place as far as in, in the rock world. Um, I was, I found myself up at Meatloaf's rehearsal loft. Wow. One day. And I know that Bob played with Meatloaf. Yeah. And I, all of the gear had Meatloaf stenciled on it, but there was nobody there at the time. We just, I was with some friends. We stopped there for a few minutes and then left. Uh, that was the only connection I had. And I know Bruce played with Blackjack. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael yeah. Bolton. Yeah, for anybody right, really Michael knew who Bolton, he was. Yeah, I had I had that the Blackjack album in my record collection that got stolen, but um, you know, I didn't know Bob back then. Um, and I, it's funny because around 1977, 78, I was hobnobbing and, and networking through the entire uh, music industry in in New York City. And all the record labels were there, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, I worked at a, at, a, at a club called Great Gildersleeves on the Bowery, which is just a few doors from CBGB's where I played. Wow. And I, and I was working for, I don't know, a dozen or, or so bands. I was doing lights. I was doing like, you know, set up and, you know, take the tear down, you know, like roadie stuff and like that. But, you know, mostly doing concert lighting. So I got to meet and talk to uh, a lot of, you know, really important people. Uh, I was working with Thor. And yeah. through that, I met, um, uh, uh, oh my God, it's on the tip of my tongue, uh, um, Felix Papillardi. Oh, okay, the Rascals, yeah. From bass player, no, bass player from Mountain. Oh, Mountain, that's right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and we were talking, and Felix paid me a real big compliment. He's, it's people like you who keep me feeling young. So that was that was a, a nice, proud high point in, in meeting and hanging out with Felix Papillardi. Uh, I, I worked for you know a lot of various bands on the New York and New Jersey yeah. club circuit or bands who had just put out an album and were just starting to go on a tour so they'd break like places like Gildersleeves because they had a, had a big stage it was a huge club so, so let me ask you Rick when you're on the New York scene back you know going back to 1972 that like you said you um, you were taking photos of Kiss like um, and you're getting into photography at that point in life where you um at all a musician where you, you picked up the bass yet or um what was the transition from you know taking photos and you know being a roadie type of guy to um becoming a musician well i had a bass and a little amp down my basement uh, i wasn't very good uh i never took any music lessons did nothing formal okay i couldn't i didn't know a from f yeah from yeah me from d and you know i would play along with the records down in the basement and, and just try to figure out what they were playing here, there, and whatever. And uh, it wasn't until I got out of high school, uh, and, you know, at 74, and I started hanging out more on the music scene. And by 75, that's when I got introduced to Max's Kansas City. Okay. Okay. And then uh, um, I was introduced to Sebastian Black. He's now known Sebastian Black. Back then, his name was Sebby Castle. Oh. He was the uh, guitar player and the leader of a group called the Martian Rock Band. Okay, so I, I was I was I met a friend who introduced me to the club to Max's and and Blondie happened to be playing there that night. You know, oh wow! Like before, before she was Blondie, yeah, yeah, <laughs> she was just Debbie Harry. Yeah. You know, and we actually did a show with her uh, uh, later on. But uh, um, so I got introduced to him and, and I said, you know, I'm I'm, I'm if they're looking for a bass player. He goes, you got a good look. I noticed from all the bands I played in, they usually pull me in because of a look. Okay. And then you know, like that, you know, and then, uh, he worked with me and taught me a lot of stuff, you know, and, and like, so, so I learned the set and we started playing out and, and that's kind of my first professional debut was in October of, of 75 at Max's. And so like, um, 
like you said, you weren't a real great player at that time. So, um, would you say you became a like a better player as as you know you progressed in that band's career? Well, well, I was Martian Rock Band when I was in and was together for like maybe four months, something okay. like that. Um, the, Sebastian gave the drummer our, our, our rent money to go pay the rent, and we had a, there was a building in Manhattan. All these bands used to rehearse in. Every floor had a different loft. And, and he gave the drummer the, 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 the rent money, and the drummer took off, bought drugs, and we never saw him again. So we lost the loft. The band broke up. Wow, wow. So so I, I got kind of discovered, if you want to call it that, mm. uh, working in, in Manhattan in the village the, 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 on 8th Street. Wow. Which is, I was a co- like a couple of doors down from Electric Lady Studios. And, and a guitar player walks in with his wife or his girlfriend, and, and we got to talking, and he was in a Jersey band. And they had, you know, they played glam stuff and Alice yeah. Cooper and Monta oh, Hoople wow. and Queen and Aerosmith and by Alice Cooper. And, and he says, you know, you got a good look. Here we go with the look again. He goes, we'd like to replace our bass player. Wow. So he brought me, introduced me. We, I did an audition for them at a, at a rehearsal studio in Manhattan. And the band was called Virgin. Oh, okay. And that's how I met Ian Chris. He was the lead singer. And they brought me in and they liked me. And, you know, I still was kind of a little green. Yeah. And the guitar player didn't like me. But yeah. Ian, visionary that he was, Ian goes, you know what? I like this guy. I want him in the band. And he tells the guitar player, Keith, do whatever you can to work with the guy. I want him in the band. So Keith, the guitar player, um, uh, worked with me, you know, and then started teaching me more and more stuff. And, and I, so I pretty much always followed what guitars, guitar players were playing, more uh, than, than, I guess, bass players. Oh, wow, that's interesting. So um, yeah. um, so I, I was going to ask, so, so um, besides Kiss, did you... Um, were you taking photos of any other bands that were like on the New York scene at the time? Yeah, yeah. At, at Coventry, uh, I shot. It was an all-female band that had one album out. They were called Isis. Okay. And they had a, like a horn section, and they, 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 they it was you know like I said one of the first early pioneer all-female bands besides Fanny. Isis was was a big band. There was uh, various groups like Turn Down Broadway. Uh, the Brats were huge. I oh, took that, yeah. Wow. The Brats. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Keith West and, and the Brats. Um, let's see, who else? Uh, oh, um, uh, uh, Sean Delaney, who worked with with the Coin Management. Yeah, he was like a partner with with Bill Coin. He would constantly come up with new bands to work with. Uh, uh, you know, out of the, the their management. Okay. Which which is where you know he discovered Fallen Angel, which became Stars. Yeah. Oh wow, Ricky ran. And there was another band he worked with called Spike. And he called me and he asked me if I'd like to come in and be involved working with Spike, which was like a three-piece version of Kiss, oh, if you wow. can imagine that. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, they wore black spandex leotards, body suits, and instead of black leather, they and this is this predates you know Striper and all that stuff. They wore yellow leather, yellow studded leather. Wow so, wow! so they had like you know leather, yellow leather collars with studs on them. I mean, like really wide collars, not like you know, dog collars, uh, you know, and armbands and yellow platform boots and, and all of that. And they were really good. This, this, they were an excellent band, great harmonies, killer songs, you know, great hooks. And then they added, eventually added a, four, uh, a fourth member, another guitarist. And they, but just for some reason, they just they ran out of steam, didn't go anywhere. So, uh, yeah. so I took pictures of Spike when they played uh, Coventry. Now, have you ever and, released any, have you ever released any of these photos that you're talking about from these other bands or, uh, uh, no, not, not, nothing official. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I still have I still have a pile of negatives of all. I still have my Kiss negatives. Yeah. I got negatives of all this other stuff. But they would probably have to be cleaned up and run through one of those machines that copies your negatives and re- reproduces them digitally. Yeah, it did. You know, you should you should strongly consider. I mean, probably would be a lot of work, but probably worth it in the end. You know, because um, like you said, a lot of over the years, people have used your stuff without permission, and you haven't received the proper credit. It'd be cool, like you put like a photo type of book of all the stuff you've done over the years, Rick, just to kind of show people, yeah, I'm the guy that did this all. You know, um, so you could receive that kind of credit. You know, like Neil Neil Zalweller, you know, um, legendary. Oh, Lo- 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 Zauer. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they put, uh, well, the, the main the main photographer on the East Coast at that point, t- that point in the '70s, uh-huh. was Bob Gruen. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, and Bob shot for Roxine Magazine, which I was in uh, a few times. Bob covered all the bands, all the clubs in New York. And, and uh, you know, in addition to Max's, Max's was like the legendary place where tons of famous bands got signed. Aerosmith, Alice yeah. Cooper, Bob Marley, uh, Bruce Springsteen. All these bands got signed at a, at a playing, you know, on the, on the stage at Max's. Where, and I got to 
play on that legendary stage. Uh, then it was CBGB's, and I, I played there in '75, and I, uh, uh, um, ACDC didn't play there until '76 or '77, so I got to play there before ACDC. Oh wow! <laughs> but uh, yeah, then we had uh, uh, we had various clubs uptown Manhattan uh, on the west side, up on the east side. There was tracks. There was. Um, uh, privates. There was uh, Phil De Havilland's club. Privates. There was, you know, several. You know, and the, the record companies would showcase the bands at these clubs. Yeah. So I got to hobnob and and network and meet a lot of people from the record labels. Oh, well, that that that's so, interesting. Now, um, I got to tell people, and and again, prepping for the interview tonight, you and I have been chatting the last few days about yeah. um, the interview we're doing now, and um, I, I went on your on your Facebook page, and I I, I picked some photos to post on my. Categorist Magazine Exposed page just to let people know we were doing the interview. And I got to tell you, some of those old photos on your Facebook page, I got to tell you, I could understand why the guy would tell you, you know, they wanted you in the band because of the way you look. I mean, um, in those photos, you looked like a rock star, Rick. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, the, the people are coming to see a show. So yeah, you yeah, yeah. give them everything they've got. You know, let me sit. People don't, in the audience, they don't want to see somebody who looks like the guy next door in the garage. They want to see you know, some, some freak from outer space, you know, they, they, they want to see something that's going to entertain them. So if you're going to be a rock star, then be a rock star. And yeah, yeah. I, I, met, I had, I had some really good, uh, mentors, I guess, or, or, uh, uh, just people to look up to that, that influenced me, you know, Angel was huge. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, you know, in the Martian rock band, I, I kind of, my character was a kind of a blend of something like Gene and Ace, like, like, a you know, interesting. A, a, you know, I was a space lizard, you know, like that. Yeah. Uh, Angel, I, I kind of had more of that Mickey Jones, Punky Meadows look. So, you know, when when uh, I got into Steeler, Ron said he heard my name being mentioned around, and, and nobody really knew who I was because I was still out of New York. Yeah, yeah. And and um, I put an ad in Music Connection magazine, so he saw it and called me. And, and he mentioned in, in, one of, in, the, um, uh, in one of his interviews, uh, L.A. Metal, uh, I think the L.A. Metal uh, uh uh, that documentary that he said he got me in the band for my looks wow. you know i mean Steeler music wasn't rush it was yeah, yeah. rocket science you know it's three chord rock and roll stuff so i, I played what the what the music called for it if i would have played anything more complex then it wouldn't be Steeler. yeah and, and i gotta say you know you look um in those pictures that i posted you look like to me a cross between kind of um you know a little bit rudy sarzo punky meadows um and i know one of your big bass influences was um Pete Way, like, would you say he was your first major influence as far as um, bass players? He was definitely an influence. Uh, back when I was shooting pictures, at, uh, you know, at con real regular concerts, um, UFO on the, the Fawcett tour opened up for Edgar Winter, with, and Edgar had um, Rick Derringer and Dan Hartman in a band, Chuck oh, Ruff. Yeah. Uh, it was like just they're going around, around the Frankenstein era. And, and I got right up to the front of the stage, and I got some close-up shots of Pete Way and, and like that. And yeah, Pete was definitely an influence. Uh, Look-wise, not so much, yeah. but playing-wise. I know this kind uh, of way... I, I can uh, see the Rudy Sarzo yeah. uh, uh, com comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Rudy once... Well, it, out of New York was a, a magazine called Hit Parader. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. And, and my friend, every night Charlie Crespo had a column in there. Charlie was a friend of mine. And and uh, he said something about my hair or something, and... and he said, Rudy Sarzo said, Rick Fox has the best hair in rock and roll. And I said, no, Rudy does, or wow. Punky does, like yeah, that. Yeah. So there was kind of this inside joke between Punky and, and Rudy and I about who has the best haircuts, you know, or the best hairstyle. Yeah, oh, yeah. oh in interesting. And um, before we get into Steel, the final thing I want to ask you is, um, you're also, no you're Nick State, I don't know, you're kind of known as a um, winged, winged knight. How did you get that, that nickname? That was because of my, my uh, Polish ancestry. Okay. Uh, my, my dad introduced me to that. And when I was doing living history and reenact, battle reenactments and renaissance fairs and military timelines, uh, which if for people who don't know what that is, it's, it's, a, it's an event that represents uh, various factions of military through history from ancient Rome to like the Gulf War. Oh, okay. And you have every, every, everything in between, all the different camps, different representations of war in the military so i picked my ancestry because there was nothing representing that you know uh, as far as the renaissance you, you had germany you had france you had spain you had italy you know all western europe nobody was covering central europe or, or anything east of that wow. so I, I my dad introduced me to the the polish wing hussars 
he showed me a picture of it once, and, and he said, you know what that is? And I said, no. And he says, that's your ancestry. Oh, wow. And he says, when, I, when, I, when he went to Vienna, to, to the the, uh, the chapel where King Sobieski held mass before they battled against the, the, the Turks of Islam who were invading Europe at the time. He says, our family coat of arms is in that chapel. It, it wasn't, it was, it, it, it's, it's a clan, you know, we're Polish yeah, yeah. clans. Oh, okay. Like that. And he says, and the coat of arms is on the wall. He showed me a picture. It's on the wall in that chapel. So we were represented at the Battle of Vienna. So that, that kind of really gives you something in your... To, you know, to uh, it puts a passion in, in your mind. You know, uh, they had a museum tour that, that came over from Poland. Oh, okay. And it w- went to eight different museums in the United States. My father goes, you have to go see this. Huh. He did, you know. Yeah. And they had, you know, winged armor on display and things like that. And I went to see this. And I'm telling you, it was like like an electric shock went through me. Oh, wow. You know, and yeah. in my head, I heard, I heard like, I'm home. I, I've, I've, I've done this. I've, 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 this is... You know, it's it's like I stuck my fingers in a socket. Oh wow, I I, I you know, get that. And, yeah, and, and, um, and I had I had what what what's been described as an epiphany. Yeah. So what was, I said, yeah. when this when this yeah. museum tour leaves America, people are going to forget about it. I said I got to do something to keep reminding them that Poland was, you know, not only the largest empire in the middle of Europe at the time yeah. in the seventeenth century, wow. but these guys these knights were badass. Oh wow, you know this this is um I, I'm glad we're doing the interview tonight, Rick, because um. You gave me an answer. I had no idea I was going to get in the sense that um, I thought it had something to do music related, and it's kind of interesting to know that um, that's what that is all about. Um, so, right. and, and, and you know, uh, Ronnie Ronnie Dio, Ronnie James Dio, has always been uh, a forerunner in showing off uh, flavors and, and atmospheres of medieval things, like yeah. in his videos and on stage and like that. So he and I are kind of like kindred spirits as far as you know the knighthood. Yeah, let me thing. ask you. I, Rick. I kind of, well, you I, mentioned. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm saying. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, but while you mentioned Ronnie James Dio, there's a photo that I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, that see, I'm always seeing on the internet of you and, and Ronnie on stage somewhere together. Could you talk a little bit about um, what that was and how you knew Ronnie? Right. Well, um, when I first kind of came into the Niji camp, which was Niji Management, which Wendy Ronnie Dio. and Wendy Dio. Yeah. Um, after after sin dissolved that, that uh, my, my band sin dissolved in, in uh, 85 86 i got an invitation to audition for a band called burn oh, okay. uh, burn burn was co-produced was produced by dana strub who produced sin and dana yeah. was producing several bands in la and and uh, the guys in burn we all knew each other and and i had a kind of a gift for writing script and, and bios and things like that oh, okay. so i i wrote i wrote the bio about the bio for burn and they had a, a video commercial for their what would be a, a um, you know uh, the record if, yeah. if it ever got to recorded like that. And they said, "Why don't you come audition for us? We you know we heard about sin. We feel bad about that, and come and audition for us." So I did. I eventually got the gig, and and I learned all their songs. And that's kind of how I got into the Niji camp because they were managed by Kurt Lorraine under under Wendy and Ronnie Dio. Oh wow! This is the same, this is the same time Wendy was managing Rough Cut. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, and all these bands, the whole stable rehearsed at Mate's rehearsal studio in North Hollywood. So, the, you know, and, and Ronnie liked us. Ronnie liked Burn a lot. Uh, uh, the singer at the time sang a lot like Ronnie. So, you know, Ronnie gravitated toward that. And he really liked it. And then uh, eventually Burn broke up after I, I left and joined uh, Surgical Steel out in, in, uh, in Phoenix, in Arizona. Oh, okay. But, but Ronnie and I kind of always had that. You know, Connection. we were into the same thing as far as like the knights and, and dragons and swords and medieval stuff. Yeah. So when they did the the We're Stars thing, oh, you know, uh, I, I didn't. I missed. I missed the studio thing they were doing. I, I was I, in Phoenix, I think, at the time with Surgical Steel. I was recording an album with Surgical Steel. But when uh, Dio was playing at Irvine Meadows, then in, in Irvine, yeah, I remember that. Uh, I, I was backstage. And Wendy came running up, grabs me by my elbow, and she goes, come on, come on, come on, just follow me, come on, come on. And she, they were grabbing anybody from the L.A. scene, any of the musicians, that are, the guys from Poison were there, uh, later from London, uh, 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 anybody and everybody, just grabbed a whole bunch of us, and they brought us out on stage. And what they did was a live version of oh. We're Stars. Oh, wow. I mean, so I tell we you, all gathered yeah. around. Yeah, we all gathered around various mics, and we sang, and we just did the "Where's Stars? Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, Ronnie did the verses, and we all joined in on the choruses. I mean, so, the 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 second time was a weekend later. 
Rough Cut was playing the country club. Wow. And a whole bunch of us were upstairs in the VIP balcony, and Wendy grabs us all and brings us down on stage. And you got, you know, uh, uh, Paul Shratino was, of course, Rough Cut. They were mm-hmm. playing uh, Vince Neil, Tom Hardy from Stormer, um, uh, Carlos Cavazzo. There was a whole bunch of us, and they, we all gathered around Ronnie, and that's kind of where those pictures, Dave Plastic took those pictures. Wow. And I had my, my Stars t-shirt on, and... and uh, I, I got next to Ronnie on the side, and, and uh, when it came to the chorus, you know, I'm taller than, than he was. He was mm-hmm. shorter. Yeah, yeah. And he looks up at me, and he takes his mic and shoves it up in my face, and he goes, Sing! Well, you know, you know, his mic had the best mix, so I, I belted it out, you know, where's the, yeah. and I could hear it coming through the, through the house like that. And, wow. and uh, so that's kind of where, you know, how that happened. And, and, and it was a high point in my career, just, just I'm so proud and privileged to have been able to share the stage with, with Ronnie James Dio. I bet, and you know, I, I gotta tell you, Rick, that's part of the reason I asked is I'm a huge Ronnie fan, and, and I mean, also, that, that to me, I can't tell you how many, ti- how many times on the internet I've seen, come across that photo of you and Ronnie. It's almost an <clears throat> iconic photo, and it, it's amazing that, um, you know, you're one of these guys that, you know, you just seem to be sometimes, um, you know, at, at a special place and a special time. Uh, that has to be just uh, one of those moments in your life that's just kind of edged in your, you know, mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been called the Forrest Gump of rock and roll because I'm in the right place at the right time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's amazing. Now um, we're going to get into Steeler now, which is um, what I really want to talk about today. But um, before we do, like, what's the point when you decide, okay, um, done my thing in here in New York, it's time to maybe give LA a try and move out there. Well. I was playing the Jersey and upstate New York circuit, club circuits, with a group called the E. Walker Band. Oh, wow. And, and we played six nights a week, four or five sets a night. You know, essentially we're a live jukebox. Yeah, yeah. And, and we did everything from Joe Jackson to Judas Priest, wow. The Doors, wow. Led Zeppelin, the Split Ends, uh, the Ramones, we punk, New, new Wave, we every, did everything. And uh, I was with them for about a year and a half, maybe almost two years, we, we did a, a short tour up in Toronto, uh, in Canada, as uh, we, we under the name Spitfire. Of course, we were doing originals, and the, the, they were trying to get signed. Yeah, yeah. And, and then um, it's just things just kind of came to a head. I, I those guys all smoke pot. Yeah. You know? and I never bonded with them. I, I never joined their little inside circle about that. So. Um, things kind of came to a head after we were done with uh, with Canada. And uh, and they raided my room and stole all my food and beer and everything. So oh, wow. that was I, 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 I had experience. enough of that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I, I, I met another guitar player who was um, he was one of the spotlight guitar players on Mike Varney's U.S. Metal series. Okay. Uh, David Ferrara, he, he's on uh, on uh, Volume Four. Okay. And and he lived in Jersey, and and his girlfriend kind of bumped into the girl I was going out with at the time in the club. They started talking. And we got to meet and talk, and we figured, hey, let's put a band together. So we put a band together called Aggressor, and we were doing a lot of the same stuff that I did when I when I left E. Walker, where I was pulling E. Walker's crowd now. And and at that that's at that time, uh, I was my day job again was back in Manhattan on Eighth Street, where, where not far from where I met the guitar player from Virgin. Mm. And and these kids walk in who were vacationing and and uh, and. Um, New York, they were from L.A., and they came to see Twisted Sister play at some festival. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> and they walked into the store I was in, you know, I said, wow, you look like a rock star. So we got to talking, and, and then they, they're Kiss fans, and I'm like, yeah, I know the guys in Kiss, and they're like, the Jaws were on the floor. I bet. I, I know Twisted Sister, I'm friends with Mark Mendoza, and the Jaws were on the floor. And they're like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And they said, we know this this band in, in California that we, we see. Um, uh, at that point, I think they were called Circus Circus. Oh, okay, yeah. And, and they were changing their name back and forth between that and sister. And he says, you know, if, if you have a phone number or something, I'd, I'd like to, t- or picture, I'd like to bring it back to, to California and show this guy. He goes, you'd be perfect in the band. You yeah. kind of have a similar look. Yeah. And he was talking about Blackie Lawless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So I gave, him, I, I gave him a phone number and a picture. I had a picture in my bag of, of when, I was, when I was playing with E. Walker. And I said, here, you know, here's the phone number, here's the picture. And I figured I'd never hear from him again. Yeah. And about a, within a month later, I started getting phone calls from from Blackie, t- 
telling me about how I should take a chance, come out to California, the scene is starting to swelter, it's getting uh, really big, yada, yada, yada. So I was friends with uh, a friend of mine who worked in the A&R department at a uh, and Records, Hernando Courtright. And his dad owned the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, which is the hotel they used in Pretty Woman. Okay. And, and he would have me come up to his office all the time. We'd listen to demo tapes. And, and I said, listen, I got an invitation to go to, to California. And he says, oh, I know who Blackie is. I said, yeah, it might be worth your worth your time. You know, and he made me demo, he made me uh, cassette copies of the first Motley Crue, uh, the EP. Yeah, yeah. That they had, they were just starting out. He, he showed me uh, uh, various tapes from bands like Snow, which was Carlos and Tony Cavazzo's band. Uh, things like he was, he was hip to what was going on in the LA scene. He goes, yeah, you should go, go, go out there and do it. See what happens. He goes, and give me right of first refusal. If you do anything, I want to hear it first. Wow, wow. And I said, okay, th- that's great. A lot of people would die for, you know, kill for something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, you know, and, and like that because they used to go up and listen to demo tapes in his office. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Uh, so I went to California, you know, Blackie, I don't know where he got the money from, because yeah. Blackie was broke, but he got scraped the money together and flew me to California, and then uh, I auditioned for the band, and over this period of two nights, and I got the gig, and, and that's, you know, how I wound up in California. Oh, wow, interesting. So, um, at that point in time, um, by the time they changed the name to Wasp, which I understand you, that was at your suggestion, um, Blackie at that point was still playing the guitar, and... Um, I guess the point where he goes back to playing bass was when um, when you were kicked out of the band. Is that correct? Something along that those lines. Yeah. When when I was in, he would, he had a, a guitar that was shaped like an iron cross, uh-huh. like a knight's cross. That's yeah. what he was playing. Um, you know, he was in the middle. Randy was on stage left. I was on stage right. Tony, of course, behind us. Um, and and we we rehearsed for like four months. We recorded the first demo, which is uh, six songs. Uh, two of which I I worked. I kind of wrote. I wrote pieces of yeah uh, which was bad and uh, uh master of disaster and then uh through personal reasons he'll never admit to uh, he called me to get uh, uh, he called me i was at his house he, he called <laughs> me over and he said listen we got to talk it's not working out and this is after we we recorded the demo he called up don atkins he, he set up a photo session he was real happy with the way everything was going yeah you know i mean it was you couldn't be happier and then uh we, we went over, my friend Hernando uh, from, from A&M came out to California on other business, and, and we went and sat in an office over at A&M Records, or the, their, their stages, um, and we played him the demo, and he liked it. He goes, but yeah, I really don't hear any hits. I don't hear anything like commercial. Wow, wow. So, you know, we, we weren't that kind of band. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, so uh, and you know, I mean, On Your Knees and, and School Days, and they weren't really like radio airplay type stuff yet. Yeah, yeah. You know? So, so that, that that fell through, and I think Blackie kind of, I think that bummed him out. And then you know, there were some some personal issues that he he would will never cop to. Yeah. And he just he just said one day, it's not working out. You're out of the band. So, when I was out, that's uh, he brought Don Costa in. Now it came to me not not long ago that Donnie. He was originally, uh, Balky was, was pitching Donnie to play in the band before he got me, and Donnie kept turning him down. He kept saying, no, I don't want to play with you. No, oh, I don't want to play with you. okay. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to be in your band. So Blackie settled, it, I guess, on me, being from, from New York, and he's from New York, so that was kind of a bonding thing, I guess. But after I was out of the band, and then Blackie, of course, forbade me to own any copies of the pictures. He said, you were to surrender all your copies of the photos. Wow. I said, I said why? Why? He goes, it's my band, they're my pictures. You know, Don, Don gave him the negative, so he said uh, he owns the pictures. Yeah, and, and that's I, the very... I went, out, yeah. I went out and made extra copies, which he found out and went ballistic. That's a very good point, because I, um, one of the first interviews that you did with me, um, we talked a little bit about that, and it, it's interesting because, I mean, if you look on the official, um, like, WASP um, website, or you look at their history, or even on their Wikipedia, I don't even think that they list Rick Fox as a um, former member. He tried to deny. He tried to deny you were ever um, part of a band. But there is that photo that you put out there, Rick. And I think it's great you did that because it kind of um, clears things up for the fans. Like, oh, okay, yeah, uh, what, what Rick is saying is true. Well, you know, it's it's now a skeleton in his closet. Yeah, yeah. It's, a thorn, it's a thorn in his side that he has to. He, people will ask him about it, and he gets pissed off, and he says, "Next question." He yeah. won't. He won't respond to it. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and we talked a little bit about Wasp, you know, in the past interview. So, 
Before we move on to Steel, um, the last thing I'm going to say about Wasp is I think it's kind of interesting that, you know, like a lot of people, I will say, I, I love that debut Wasp album. It's got like classic, that's a classic Wasp to me. And it's kind of interesting. If you look at the cover, the album cover for that, it's Wasp is presented very much like, like in a band format. But by the time you get to the second Wasp album, um, it's just Blackie on the cover. So at that point, he's already um, got it in his head that Wasp is his his band, his solo project, and that's really what it has turned into. Yeah, it, it kind of always was. Yeah, uh, yeah. It became more so once he got hooked up with Rod Smallwood for management. Yeah, yeah. He got he got wise. He got a little too smart, and he wound up uh, uh, like he did to Chris. I, I know Chris's uh, in do Chris's documentary. He talked about this where he he uh, he had everybody else listed as session players. Wow. Instead, instead of uh, actual band members. Interesting. You know, and when, yeah. when they started seeing the writing on the wall, they, they knew it was, you know, what it's black. Here's my picture here, here's my picture here. And he kept justifying it by saying, well, the label wants it, the label wants it, which is utter BS. Yeah, yeah. So you know. you're, you're out of Wasp at this point, and, um, you know, what's what's the point from, you know, um, being kicked out of Wasp or leaving um, to hooking up with um, Ron Keel? Well, like I said, uh, Donnie... He, he managed to convince Donnie to come in. Donnie came in and did a couple, one or two shows, and he did the, the whole cheese grater thing on his knuckles. I guess he upstaged Blackie, and Blackie kicked him out. Oh, and, wow. and, and like that. So uh, that's when he brought Chris in. Okay. Like that. You know, and then Chris, then he went switched over to bass. Um, so meanwhile, once I'm cut loose, I'm like floundering. I'm, I'm, I'm lost in L.A. pretty much. I'm, yeah. I'm from New York. We didn't have an internet. I, there was no way for me to kind of prove who I who I was or yeah, what I yeah, did yeah. or who I, who I knew. You know, it was all word of mouth, and uh, so uh, I was living with some with some uh, high class call girls. Okay. Uh, on Clark Street, right next door, uh, the, the next apartment over from where Motley Crue was living. That's how I got to meet Nikki and Tommy. Wow. Uh, and and we kind of bonded like that. And then um, and then uh, I, I wound up. Uh, getting a, moving into with, into, into an apartment with somebody else who eventually turned on me. Uh, oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the, the guy who the guy who gave Blackie my phone number, he he felt bad when I got got canned out of Wasp. He says, "Well, I got an apartment in Hollywood. You know, with you know, why don't you move in with me?" Okay. So yeah. I, I moved into his place. We were we were like right around the corner from Cantor's Deli. Oh wow! Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I know that like area. Like that, you know, and and uh, so um, I was still networking. And uh, we used to invite various band members uh, uh, that we go see at the clubs over to our apartment because we'd have a barbecue out on the sidewalk, like that. Yeah, you know, yeah, we yeah. invited Rat, Rat, and, and this band and that band. You know, and I'd be throwing like way tons more of, of lighter fluid on the on the or, or uh, barbecue fluid on the, on the fire. We had like nuclear clouds going off up in the, up in the air like that. Oh wow! Anyway, they, everybody thought I was like crazy, yeah. was funny, and crazy and like that. So uh, I wound up auditioning for Rat. In in uh, Stephen Piercy's mother's uh, grandmother's garage in oh, Culver wow. City. Okay. I still I, I still have the tape they gave me to learn the songs. Uh, and then uh, I auditioned for the Greg Leon Invasion. Oh, I know Greg. Which, yeah. Okay. Which is how I found our drummer by, for the first lineup of Sin, which was uh, Carl James, Carl Elizondo. Um, but you know, I was just bouncing back and forth. Uh, I jammed a few times with Hellion. Oh, you know, wow, nothing really, nothing came of it. We, we, we all got along. This is like before Burn. Burn yeah, yeah. started out as Hellion. Oh, okay, okay. See, yeah. With Anne Boleyn. But then when they formed Burn, they, I guess they kicked Anne out. I don't know what, why. Uh, politics or something, I don't know. And that's when they became Burn. But when they were Hellion, I jammed with them a few times. We got along really well. And then um, I, I kind of got introduced to a band in North Hollywood that was rehearsing right off of Lancashire and, and Magnolia. It was called uh, Warlord. Wow. So I was, and that, that was a challenge, biggest challenge musically for me. Cause I, I never really played much. Uh, I'd, I'd never had any call to play a minor, completely minor scale material. And these guys were like full on, everything was minor scale, dark, you know, black more beats, D.O. type, oh, type wow. stuff. And, and, uh, you know, the drummer, Mark Zonder went on to play with, with metal church. He's a great drummer. I'd love playing with him, you know, and, and, uh, the guitar player, uh, uh, Bill, uh, he just died recently, not too long ago. Um, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, he he uh, he's, he's kind of like Blackmore, you know. Okay. He kind of looked a little like him, played like. So I I know we rehearsed for like 
four months. You know, if they didn't like the way I played, then they could have said something like within the first day or two and said, you know, it's not working out. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, later on they said, yeah, well, we weren't really weren't happy with Rick. Well, then then why did you have me play with you for four months, you know? I guess just to get gigs, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I was rehearsing with them, and then one night I said, hey, you know, when are we going to get a singer and play out live? And they were like, they freaked. They're like, this go dude this ain't a this ain't a, a live band we're we're just gonna record we're gonna be like a session band oh okay I, I said, why didn't you tell me that when i first hooked up with you guys i said i'm a live player yeah yeah you know i mean i'm all for recording but i i'm a i'm a performer i, I perform i play live on stage and you know so we we kind of agreed that uh, this to, to disagree and it wasn't going to work so i picked up my bass and i walked out you know and that's yeah. i put the ad in music connection magazine and then uh, Ron contacted me and, and said, you know, meet me over at the, uh, the, the what they call the Steeler Mansion, which was an inside joke because it was a roach infested bunch of uh, several buildings, all, you know, rooms all attached together. Yeah. And, well, and uh, uh, like that. So, and I had seen Steeler. Yeah. I, I just saw Steeler playing at the Roxy. I was, me and, me and Eric Carr were there, Eric, you know, from Kiss. Oh, we were wow. There wow. Watching. And, I, and the band was good musically, they were really tight. Uh, Ron stuck out to me as the rock star. Yeah, he yeah. Was, he, was the, he was the performer. You know, the musicians were good. Mike Dunnigan was good. Tim Morrison was good. His drummer was good. But they weren't really weren't show guys. And so, uh, by the time what, you know what yeah. was going on in, in, in L.A. So, so anyway, so Ron contacted me. I met him, and I walked into his place, and he's sitting on the drum riser, and I said, "Where's all your gear? What? Where's the band?" And he says, uh, "I fired everybody, man." Wow. Everybody's gone. I fired everybody and like that. And I said, man, that's, that, you took a huge leap of faith. Yeah. yeah. You know, he goes, well, um, you know, they, what I didn't know is they had uh, uh, done uh, showcases for every label in town. Oh, wow. And, and they got turned down. And Ron goes, I want a band that looks like we're already signed. We're rock stars. You know, we're, we're the biggest thing since sliced bread. I want, I want to go, I want to hit the stage like we're already there, man. I went, yeah. okay. He goes, oh, I heard about you. You got a good look. That's the look thing again. Yeah, yeah. He goes, he goes, take this tape, learn the songs, no promises. We'll see what happens from there. I said, okay. I took the tape. I learned the songs. I went back, and, and it was just Ron and I together. It was no one else. Just, we just went over the songs. Wow. And, and over the course of that, you know, I got to talk about more about it. I was, afraid I was with the, part of the Kiss universe like he's a big kiss fan so i said sean delaney i learned all of the stage moves that kiss did through sean uh he taught it to stars you know the bands he worked with all that stage choreography and you know and i like to think ron was really interested and excited in that uh he had had a new drummer who was out of town at the time uh it was mark edwards wow. mark came back in town and we rehearsed three piece and and that's that was like november into december of 1982 now, uh, Mike Varney, I know, helped to get Ink Thing in the band, but um, was he yeah. was he connected with the band prior to that? Well, Ron was talking to, to Mike Varney about that okay. uh, on the side. Yeah. I, I I really didn't know what their the band business was about, what they were doing for guitar players okay. at that point. Um, I had moved into the Steeler Mansion. And I, I I picked a corner that was kind of my room, and like that, and I decorated it and everything, and and. Uh, like that and it was right next to the rehearsal room so there was no escape from the, from the sound but uh, um, yeah Ron and Varney were discussing various guitar players and, and uh, sent Ron some tapes and they discussed uh, Ingve. and I remember how there was a three way phone conversation uh, between Varney Ingve, and us and, and like that and, and Ron pretty much knew what he what he wanted to get and and uh, they arranged for uh, Ingve to come to America you know, in, yeah, in uh, yeah, yeah. February of, of uh, 82. Kind of, it's kind of weird because I arrived in L.A. In, in, on February 4th of 82, and Ingve arrived in L.A. For kind of around the same time in 83. Interesting. And, and you know, um, the, the thing is, people got to realize, this is for anybody really knew who Ingve was. I mean, um, and so, like, um, I, I imagine uh, eventually you guys, you know, meet Ingve or before that, even, like, you get a, any kind of press kit on him, like photos or videos or anything. No, we just heard the tape. Oh, heard okay. The tape of him, you know, cassette tape. Yeah, yeah. Him going, you know, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, every song was that. So, you know, the biggest, the, the biggest guys in town that did that was was Eddie Van Halen and and George Lynch. Yeah, yeah. You know, from Dawkins. So, to to hear this, we were like, wow. You know, now if we can incorporate that into Steeler music, that would be 
something that, that no one's ever seen or heard of. And of course, that proved itself to be true. Yeah, yeah. Like that. And then, uh, so they arranged to have Malmsteen come to America. And, and it just seemed to me that uh, the guy that got off the plane was not the same guy we talked to on the phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, um, one thing I want to make clear when I, you know, doing my homework on this, I, last night I was listening to the entire Steeler album. And, and I'm listening to kind of fresh ears because. I've heard some of the stuff, but I haven't heard, I never heard the whole thing, you know, from top to bottom. And, and after doing so, Rick, I got to say to me, it's like, what took me so long to listen to this album? It's like a masterpiece of an album. But, but what's interesting is, um, I was reading where some guy, had, um, some critic or someone said something to the effect that, um, you know, when he listened to the album, he thought it was going to be, a, and I guess this was back in the day when it was first released, he, he knew it was going to be a collector's item because simply just for no other reason than Ink Face playing on the album. Now, I, I don't totally agree with that because I think the, I think the whole band really shines on the album, but the interesting thing I notice is um, for most of the album, Ink Face playing, there's not a lot of overplaying on this album. It seems like maybe um, he was told to hold back a little while you guys were recording the album. Uh, talk a little bit about that, because um, he's got some solid playing here, and I think, you know, if you want to hear Ink Face kind of go off and do his thing, you know, you can get any of his solo albums, but the, um, maybe because it's his first recording, I don't know, but some of the, the, the playing here is much more tasteful. It's not all over the place, if you know what I mean. Well, that's a matter of opinion based on who you talk to. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, the best birthday present I could get in 1982 was was when we were at the Rainbow and, and Ron Keel looks over me and goes, "You're in the band, man. You're in the bass <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That that was my official, you know, notice that I was in the band. So, uh, you know, through, through the course of January was when we were talking to to Momstein over the phone and, and hearing the, the demo tape and like that. So the arrangement was made to fly him to to here and. And, uh, well, he, he plugged in, and, and uh, like, I what? think he was, he was 19. Yeah, you know, yeah, he was yeah. A young, yeah. He was a young, pist he was a hot pistol arrow. Yeah. You know, uh, he was, he, he hit culture shock when he walked into the Steeler Mansion because, you know, we were living like hand to mouth, and it was roaches everywhere. He, he wasn't ready for that. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I mean, uh, you talk about yeah. Stephen Pierce. It kind of reminds me, I always hear him talking about, from back in the day, um, what they call Rat Mansion West. <laughs> Where, where they had a little similar type of dig that they were all living in. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, he had the room that was the kitchen area that had a water bed. Wow. And, and that's where most of the roaches like to congregate was around the stove. You know, and you, when you turn on the stove and you light the pilot light, you can hear all this tiny little pitter-patter sounds of the roaches bailing out of the stove and hitting the floor on the newspaper, you know, like that from when you turn the gas on. But anyway, you know, he had that on his mind. I bet, like, yeah. What, you know, he was like, what the frick did I just land in? Yeah, 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 I bet, you know? yeah. So, so we go to plug in and, and go over the songs. And at one point, he, he, we stop and he goes to, to Ron. He goes, hey, man, like, is there anything you could do to make these songs, like, like more interesting, man? Because, like, they're really quite boring, you know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> and I looked up at, up at the drum yeah. riser at Mark. Mark looked at me, and we were like, did we just hear what we thought we heard? Yeah, yeah. You know, new guy just told the boss his song sucked. <laughs> yeah. You know, essentially. And and Ron did what I call the slowest, the quickest slow burn you ever saw. His face turned red, red, red. He, you, you could tell Ron, Ron was furious. Yeah. And, I, and like that. And, and we started, Ron made a decision to start auditioning other guitar players right in front of Ingve. Wow. That must be well, Ingve was there. You know, he had to hear these other guys coming in. I don't remember how two or three, yeah, four yeah. guys, you know, we were auditioning various guitar players. And if Ingve finally turns around and goes, all right, man, I'll do it your way. Well, I'll play the game like that. And we, and we fucking finally settled down and we, we concentrated what we were doing. And that's, it started to come together. And, and he was, you know, being, he was being Ingve. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, you know noodling here and there and everything like that so you know, we tried to keep it within the context of the songs yeah, you know, yeah he wanted he wanted the whole song to be him and he'd fill every every breathing space would be him blazing away and you know he had to kind of learn where it was okay to put the noodling in oh yeah yeah you know, because even you can hear it even in the ballad, and, and, you know, and, and no, way, no way out, and, and serenade. Yeah. You know, he's still kind of pushing the envelope in some places where you need to lay back and, and play to the melody. And it's it's just you know Blackmore and Uli Roth in between all of these beautiful arrangements. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, like that. So so uh, he, he was pushing us to get whatever he could get in there, you know, like that. And and at, by that point, he was already planning on, on getting out of the band. I, I think he was using Steeler as a, in retrospect. Launching he, pad. He, he, yeah. He was, yeah, he was using Steeler as a launching pad because he jumped right out of that after four months and, and was all over. He was looking at, at uh, uh, UFO and, and some other stuff, and then he got nailed for Alcatraz. Yeah. But I'll, I'm here to tell you, that first debut show at the country club uh, march 11th 83 and we were opening for hughes thrall oh wow amazing glenn hughes yeah. you know yeah and, and and we're on stage and you know country club had those big thick red velvet like theater curtains oh yeah 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 you know and and they were gathered at certain points and then that curtain would go up and you were like excited if you're in the audience you know in, in anticipation and and the curtain starts to go up and my mic stand starts to go up with it and get caught, caught in the curtain <laughs> oh yeah yeah and you know so um, kinda, they're like stop stop and lower the curtain and roadies come out and move my mic out of the way and the curtain goes up and we launch into, you know, On the Rocks and the next song and the next song and the next song, Backstreet Driver, like that. And you could see the audience. That There was, like, astonishment. Yeah, I mean, you know, like you said. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, Jaws were on the floor. Yeah, because I tell you, like you were saying at that time, only guys that played like that were, um, you know, Eddie Van Halen and George Lynch. So this new guy, Inkve, I mean, um, coming on the scene, it, it had to be amazing. But it, it kind of... Um, it's kind of interesting because you, because you look at Ink Faith's career, even what he's doing now, he just came out with a new solo album, and I, I heard where he was talking about um, the fact that, that he, he decided, like on his last couple of solo albums, he's just going to take over and, and be the lead singer as well because he doesn't get along with singers or whatever. So it's kind of interesting to see that um, he carry, he continues to have problem working with singers, you know? Well, Ingve is an interesting study in, in being yeah. a solo artist and seeing how many things he can do all together on his own uh, live that you can't do uh, you know in the studio yeah, right? yeah. well you can do it in the studio but you can't do live you know yeah yeah like that so it's, it's interesting juxtaposition with that that's that's kind of funny but uh I, I tell you when 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 he started blazing away yeah the closest thing i can equate it to is the the um the response or or the the uh, uh, uh um in, in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Oh wow, wow, okay, when okay. They, when they were going, when they were yeah. going against the French knights and the guys up on the castle wall, and he, and they push that that Trojan horse rabbit, that wooden rabbit. Oh, okay, wow. And yeah. he does that look, that swooping head double look, yeah. and he like that's kind of what people were doing when they looked over at Ingve going, well, "Holy, sh oh my God, where did that guy come from?" Sweden. You know, and they looked yeah. over on my yeah. they looked over on my side and go. Who is this guy? Didn't I see him at a club walking around somewhere? You yeah. know, and, and, and so Ron pretty much, you know, Ron, yeah, yeah. Ron brilliant, you know, he's a brilliant tactician. Yeah. And, and when we hit the stage and, and it, that was it, it was like, that was our, our night to shine, you know, and like that. Even Pat Thrall, the guitar, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. guitar player for, for Houston, Pat Thrall was standing in the doorway on, on my side, stage right watching from backstage and i shit you not his jaw was open oh i bet it's like wow um watching this... malmstein he's never seen anything like nobody ever seen anything like that yeah um you know it, it was pretty funny you know i, I nudged ron i went look over there he's, he's like we're laughing Pat all gonna stand there with his mouth open yeah and you know um you know? I, I gotta tell you rick other thing amazing about listening to this album for the first time in its entirety is um I, ron keel i mean he really shines on this album this is dr but I mean, if you think, if you listen to just um, the Keel albums and you think that's Ron Keel, people have no idea. I mean, he, he's reaching those high notes like uh, Halford or Dickinson would on this album, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, Ron's a unique singer of his own of his own kind. And, yeah. You know, I never heard anybody else like him or, or anyone else since. So, you know, uh, he knew what he was doing and it still does. And, and yeah. uh you know, he, he hit the nail on the nose. Uh, like yeah. that. I, was, I was very fortunate uh, uh, to be blessed to yeah. be put on the map at that place in time and, and uh, you know, open some doors for me. So, you know, yeah. my gratitude for that. Because it's amazing. Like, we, we talked throughout the interview. You've had these moments in your career and your life, Rick, where you kind of were at the right place at the right time. But um, anytime you hear anything about Rick Fox, the, the main thing people will um, point to is that Steeler album. And, you know, I'd like to get into some of the songs now. Now, first one I want to talk about is Cold Day in Hell. What a great opening track. I mean, it's a great rock and tune, but I think you guys uh, made a great decision with opening the album with that one. 
Well, what, what what happens is like if you look at the well the album and the CD, yeah, the sides the sides are reversed. Oh, okay. Cold Day in Hell starts side one, but that was actually the middle of our set, yeah. our live set. The, the set actually opened with with On the Rocks, which was on side two. Oh, okay. Song six. So so we opened with On the Rocks, Down to the Wire, Born to Rock. Serenade was at the end of the, of our or near the end of our set. But, you know, right in the middle of the set was Cold Day in Hell, like, like that. So we kind of, the songs were mixed up, and since Cold Day in Hell was previously a single on, on the Metal Massacre album, they put that it, made, first. it made sense to put it as the first song. You know, uh, back in the days of radio, when he, when he put it, they'd get a record, they always put the single as the first cut, because that's where the DJ puts the needle down, right on the first song. Yeah, and, and you, mentioned you, know? the, you mentioned the song um, On the Rocks, I gotta say, I think... Um that um, that song really stood out to me. It's just um, I think it might just even maybe my favorite song of the whole album. And to me, to my ears, it sounds like um, a little bit of Judas Priest with a taste of Iron Maiden in there. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, there's a little, little, little bit of all of that in there. Um, I, I love On the Rocks too. Ron doesn't want to doesn't like doing that song, but you know. Uh, oh, you, that, well, yeah, um, he I, is I, a singer. I, I like it. You yeah. know, I you know I, I play with the songs every once in a while over the years. And I wish I knew then what I know now. I, yeah. I, I I have better bass lines for the for the songs than I did back then. Yeah, and another yeah. another track I really liked was um, "Hot on Your Heels." Um, Ink they goes off a little on this track, and that's all right because it, it seems to fit the song. And what's interesting about this song is the vocals don't come until a little after four minutes. So it's, it's really mainly an instrumental track, and then vo vocals kind of come towards the mid. mid. But, yeah, that that was just you know the yeah. vo we had other songs to put on yeah. the album, but Mike Varney wanted something to spotlight Malmsteen on. Of course, so that's, so, that, and, and when I'm listening, that's exactly what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, okay, Mike, Mike Barney's this guy who discovers these great guitar players. He had, he had that label, Shrapnel, and that's kind of what the point of that, of that um, label was, that was to showcase the guitar players. So when I'm listening, right. I think yeah. it kind of makes sense, you know? Yeah, he had all, all, all kinds of pistoleros on, on uh, Shrapnel. So, you know, Malmsteen was another one. So he gave him that spot right there in front of Hot On Your Heels, which at the end, when he does that that reverse uh, mm. phasing thing, they used on on the uh, the radio show Metal Shop. Yeah, oh, interesting. I was going to ask you about that because you know when I was listening to it last night, um, I used to listen to that radio show Metal Shop with Charlie Kendall, and I yeah. was, I'm thinking last night, hey, that sounds like kind of the introduction to Metal Shop. <laughs> wow. It is. It, that's that was yeah. It was what we did right before. Uh, um, uh, we go right into Hot on Your Heels, so that was part of uh, Ingvay's solo, and, and they used that. That they they did a, they snipped a section of it and used it on Metal Shop. Now, how did how how did that come about? Like, did did Varney kind of um, or his label kind of reach out to the you know the, the show, or did the show reach out to you guys and say, hey, we'd like to use that track? I have I was out of the loop on that one. I have no oh, idea. Oh, interesting, interesting, but. I just I remember hearing it like like everyone else on the radio. I hearing that. I went. Wait a minute. That's off our album. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, see. So there's stuff all throughout you know metal history that you guys are kind of connected with yeah. that we're just learning about. Um, another song you mentioned was um, which I really like. No way out. What I like about this song is um, when the song starts off. Okay, it starts off kind of slow, and it, you, you almost think it's going to be maybe a a ballad. But then I, I, what I really love is it kind of it all of a sudden really you know kicks some ass and picks up speed and it's like a, a great little surprise if you know what i mean yeah that was uh <clears throat> that was our attempt at uh trying to sound like def leppard because okay. at that time yeah. uh, uh our drummer mark edwards he was really really tight with the guys in leopard uh, rick allen was a close personal friend wow. of his and and he got us they played at irvine meadows and and got us all passes to go see the show which was the Pyromania show. Wow. So, so we were at that height, and, and we went to see the show, and then uh, uh, we went to the hotel afterwards, we hung out with them and like that and, and whatnot. Uh, and, you know, we were, everybody was so influenced by the stuff on Pyromania, we were like, okay, what can we, what can we do to kind of sound De Def Leppard-ish and get something kind of a little more commercial? And that, that was the end result was, was no way out. Oh, wow, that's cool. And, and then... Um I love the song too, Backstreet Driver. Um, it's kind of another heavy rock tune. Um, it's got a great melody to me, as, as do all these songs. Um, one thing I say is, um, great melody running through all these songs, no matter how heavy they are, were. Well, they're all you know, straight, straight in your face, driving hard rock and roll. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, some people put it down because of its simplicity, and other people yeah, yeah. raise it up. Up, up, raise it up and, and praise it because of you know it's it's a uh, you know in your face no yeah. no no complexity straight ahead rock and roll 
you know and and yeah. uh, of course my favorite is cold ain't hell because the lyrics yeah yeah are, are the personal experience of ron trying to get signed in the record business oh wow yeah yeah makes makes sense and and now um let me ask you now how surprised were you when um you know ron eventually goes on to form keel and then um gene simmons would go on to produce those T- keel albums did you have any thing to do with hooking them up or did they kind of find themselves um on their own no, that was on their own. Yeah, Gene, Gene and, and Ron. They, uh, uh, Keel had gone on the, on the road and did open some shows for Kiss. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I remember. You know? that. And then so when it came to the time to get in the studio, uh, Ron could explain it better. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just just was but, wondering. But yeah, they, they hooked up with Gene, and Gene came in and, and uh, showed him the ropes and and, and handled uh, producing them. Okay, and and so I guess it's great they made that connection finally. But um, now I know um, could we talk a little bit about the last time I did an interview with you, but. I know um, another Kiss guy you kind of had a connection with, um, unpleasant one, was Vinny Vincent. And um, I don't know if you want to get into that, but I know that um, he, on the Vinny Vincent Invasion second album, there's a song they had called um, Let Freedom Rock. And, and it was apparently a, a, a demo that um, Dana Strum had produced um, before that for your band Sin, I believe. And they had kind of um, stole that song from out, out from under you. Um, 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 you want to tell people a little bit about that? You didn't hear my eyes just roll, did you? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, Dana was Dana was producing several bands in Hollywood at the time in the, in the mid '80s. Yeah. Uh, Sweet Savage from Texas, Burn, as I said earlier, Sin, our, my band, and and you know a couple other bands. I think Rated X and like that. I, you know, he was he was trying to see what else he could get signed after he yeah. put Brandy Rose and Ozzy. Yeah, yeah. Like that, and and uh, so he was kind of I call it, he was data mining. You know, okay. They call it now. And and uh, he was working with us with Sin. We were in the studio. We were in uh, Kendon Studios, yeah. which is in Burbank, uh, on Spec Time. And you know, Paul McCartney recorded there, and Stevie Wonder. So all the heavy hitters recorded there. So they brought us in at night on Spec Time, uh, on, on downtime. And you know, we we did a four song demo on the run. Of course, was one of them. Uh, it was our our strongest song. And. Uh, this is like around winter of '85. Yeah. I walked, I walked in one night, and there's Vinnie Vincent sitting at the console. The data's playing him on the run. Wow! So I walk in, and they kind of they went for a few bars, and then they shut it off. And it was like, hi, <laughs> like, oh, uh, you know, somebody's with the other woman, and somebody else walks yeah, yeah. in. Kind of, that's the best way I can describe the look on their face. And Vinnie goes, he goes, yeah, you look familiar. And I said, I said probably recognized my face from when you were at, at, at SIR Studios rehearsing at Ace Fraley's Lightning Boots in that room by yourself and he goes that's where you look I walked in by accident because I could hear the Ace Fraley licks yeah oh wow wow and I opened the door it was the room that Motley Crue and, and uh, would use and they would give us their, their leftover time uh, for sin so I, I knew the room and I opened the door and I hear these Ace Fraley and there's Vinnie Vincent standing there with a Marshall stack and Ace's lightning boots, the thigh high lightning boots. Wow! But he's, he's, you know, he was learning kiss material, I yeah, guess. Yeah, you know, so, and, yeah. So Vinny goes, that's that's where you look familiar from, and he goes, so hey, we're listening to this song, Dana's producing, and it's uh, sounds really killer. He goes, I really like it a lot. He goes, he says maybe there's a possibility up the road somewhere, maybe we can uh, re- re-record it. Oh, okay. And have you have you come in and be involved? And we never defined what have you come in and be involved was. Mix, yeah. That was never established. Yeah. And that was the last kind of I heard about it. I don't remember what happened the rest of the night from that. I think Vinny left or something. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, probably right before the next Nam show, uh, I, I get a demo from my publicist who was working with Vinny. He goes, she goes, you're not going to like this. And she put she put the tape on of the song "Let Freedom Rock." Yeah, and and it was like I was stu- absolutely stunned. Wow! And and right around that time, this is right before Fred Corey joined Cinderella. Uh huh. He was in the band London, and he he wanted to get out of London. He goes, Rick, I want to play with you. I want to be in Sin. And I said, Fred, I want you to hear something. He was over at my apartment in Hollywood. Yeah. I want you to hear something. I said, you remember On the Run, right? He goes, oh, yeah, it's my favorite song. Fred loved On the Run. Wow. All right. I put on, I didn't tell him who it was. I put on Let Freedom Rock. He goes, oh, did you do a different version of this? Is this a different cut? And I then took the tape out and held it up. It said Vinnie Vincent of He goes, dude, he goes, you just got taken into cleaners. Yeah, well, well, you know, um, the reason I bring this up is I was a bit of a Vinnie Vincent fan back in the day. 
Um, much more of a kiss fan, but but I will say this: I, I think um, the guy, though, I mean, he, he's ripping off the fans even these days. I mean, um, to the sense that I see where on his website he sells these CDs. These two solo CDs came out like over 20 years ago, and he's selling them for 150 dollars because it's got his autograph on it. You, you got to be kidding me! <laughs> yeah, well, the guy's got a got a track record and a consistency. Yeah. Of- doing you know um and, and inscrutable things and, yeah, yeah. and illegal things and taking advantage of people and he's he's he, the guy's just not consistent from one day to the next yeah, yeah. you and, know i yeah. mean you know he was he was going to do something with and have uh, uh do some shows have carmine apathy come in on drums which would have been and, great yeah i don't know why and, he, and, he didn't yeah and, and and jim crean who i recorded two songs yeah, with yeah. on his london fog album jim crean was going to come in and sing and then, and then Tony Franklin was going to play bass. And then uh, Vinny just kind of like flipped out and said, "No, never mind, never mind." Yeah. He didn't. He didn't like Jim Crean or Jim yeah, Crean's yeah. voice or his looks or something. He didn't like something about Crean, I think. And so that fell apart. Wow. So it's been constantly this been on again, off again thing about Vinny's going to do something, then yeah. he's not, then he is, and he's yeah. not. So it's it's constantly crying wolf, and yeah. people are like, "All right, enough already." Yeah, final question for a night, Rick. Now, um, I see that you posted a nice little tribute to um, Jeff Labar on your page the other day, and Facebook was kind of giving trouble about that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, uh, as I said, you know, I've been friends with, with Fred Corey since before he joined Cinderella. Yeah. And, uh, and and so, you know, whenever they would come hit, hit L.A., whoever they were opening for, whoever they were playing, you know, Fred was really popular. You know, everybody in Hollywood knew Fred, and yeah, they yeah. would barrage him for tickets and passes to the point of like, look, I can only get so many people in, you know. Uh-huh. So so I think what happened was um, Fred gave the phone or something, my phone number, to Jeff. Wow. And Jeff, well, Jeff calls me up. He goes, hey, listen, he goes, everybody knows Fred. Fred's yeah. the party guy in L.A. <laughs> he goes, I don't know anybody. He goes, would you, would you, would you, would you like to be my guest? Oh, I, was like, cool. I was floored. I was like, "Are you serious? This is not a joke, right?" See, yeah, this yeah. no series. He goes, "I don't know anybody to hang out with." He goes, "I'll give you passes and everything. You come hang out with us, hang on the bus and whatever. Come see, come to the show, you know, and hang out with me." I went, "Sure." Oh, how you know? cool is that? And that's, yeah. that's how I kind of got really bonded with with Jeff, you know. And I went down to Irvine and I saw them. We hung out on the bus and we, you know, yeah, yeah. yada and like that. So, so that's kind of how uh, my introduction to. to bonding with with jeff and and you know every time i'd see him when they were through town hey hey you know oh cool we friend yeah, yeah like that so we were, we were pretty good friends and then you know uh, uh you know, everybody knows kind of off and on yeah. you know he's had some problems with, yeah 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 you know, alcohol and sobriety mm-hmm. and like that and he was trying to do the best he could you know and he, he became a chef and uh things weren't working out with cinderella with with the reunion yeah yeah and, uh, he was doing stuff with the chef, and he, you know, I'm a kind of, I'm a chef. He's a chef, so we we were kind of like something else to bond with. We're comparing recipes and stuff like that, you know. Oh wow! And and, and hitting like and and, and you know uh, like yeah, yeah. congratulatory uh, you know, gifts and stuff like that uh, on, on Facebook mm-hmm. and whatnot. Yeah. And then I got the, uh, a singer that I worked with in another band in LA contacted me the other night. He goes, "Hey, did, is Jeff Labar? Did he pass away?" I said, "I don't know why." He says, "Everybody's posting on Facebook." Oh wow! So yeah, I, I went to Jeff's page, and his son Sebastian posted. I got the word; my father passed away, and like that, I was like, "Holy crap! No, uh, you know, it was unbelievable." Yeah, I didn't see that one coming. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd like to thank you, Rick, for doing the interview. Um, I, I learned a lot of stuff about you tonight. Um, maybe you know, next time we um, do this, I'd like to you know talk about sin. We haven't talked about that too much, um, and maybe the decline of Western civilization. And we didn't we didn't get to cover uh, my, my recording on uh, on Jim Crean's album. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, because um, um, if you don't mind, Rick, um, maybe we could do a two-parter. Like, um, I'll, I'll post this first in August, and then if you don't mind, um, maybe we could do that. All right, sounds good. Sounds okay. good. You know, it's always a pleasure talking with you. So if you, as long as we got people who are interested in hearing what i got to say, I'll keep talking. I, I, I think I think you do, as you can see on the page today. Um, well, you take care, Rick, and the interview will be going up like in early August, okay? All right. Uh, we, oh, you know what? We forgot to hit Rock and Pod. Oh, okay, okay, sure. We were supposed to hit Rock. I, I'm going to be one of the featured guests finally at the Rock and Pod uh, convention in in, uh, in August on August sixth that weekend in in uh, Nashville, Tennessee.